for today of this wonderful workshop. Uh, for the first talk this morning, we're uh, very privileged and fortunate to have Professor Manfred Oper uh, visiting us. Uh, I don't think Professor Oper needs an introduction in this community. He's made seminal contributions to uh, topics that span the range of what this workshop is about. Uh, and this morning, he'll tell us a bit about the replica method for approximate inference. Uh, so please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really happy to be here and would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. And when I uh, was invited, I thought, hey, this is great. I can learn a lot of new stuff and I'm not disappointed. There's a lot of new stuff going on. But then in second thoughts, goodness, I haven't really worked in recent years on structured data. I did a few other things. Uh, uh, what shall I talk about? And uh, so, um, I got the idea to speak actually about older work, if uh, I allowed myself to do that. Older work with uh, Dörte Malzahn, that work came out of um, some um, work that we did on uh, approximate uh, resampling methods, and but possibly got a little bit overlooked and uh, uh, was briefly mentioned uh, on, on the first day by Professor Takahashi. And I hope that I can give a little bit of a uh, complementary point of view on the question of Gaussianity. And um, so let's see if that could be useful. Um, okay, let me see. Uh, what to do? Uh, uh, uh. Oh. Ah, but this, does, does, this doesn't work. Oh, it does work, yes. Okay, so my motivation um, came, of course, from um, the earlier work on statistical physics using uh, the replica method, and I still believe it's a very powerful method, and I, um, I know that uh, by many of you, it, the results have been uh, made rigorous uh, in, in many cases, not the technique uh, itself, uh, but I still believe it's a very nice tool that um, can give you answers, and in this talk I will uh, combine it with um, uh, approximate inference method. But the usual typical ingredient, uh, uh, the replica method, the way it's used um, very often is we need to have a tractable input distribution that somehow leads to Gaussian densities of certain random variables uh, uh, by Gaussian equivalence, and then at the end, it allows us to do explicit uh, um, expectations uh, in, in, um, using, uh, using uh, um, Gaussian integrals. The second typical ingredient, and that made me always a bit worried about uh, when it comes to uh, you know, comparing to real data, was we need to have also a tractable target model, usually called the teacher. And in the past, of course, there had been so many teacher-student scenarios discussed, of course, mainly in, in, in simple neural networks, but we see now uh, um, also um, yesterday that it can be done in, in a much uh, broader way. But it seems we have to define a teacher also. Um, yeah, that together with the input distribution leads to some tractable random variables. And. Um, so if you want to use a comparison on real data, and I think also yesterday we saw this is nicely possible in the unsupervised learning case, but maybe it's a bit non-trivial in the supervised case where we need this teacher. And I uh, read a very nice paper, Learning Curves of Generic Feature Maps. Fe um, feature Maps had been uh, discussed yesterday as well for realistic data sets within a teacher-student model. So. Um, it was shown that I think this, this, this defining an appropriate teacher is okayish in the uh, in the regression case, but already on real data for some classification cases, there were uh, uh, significant uh, um, deviations uh, between um, computed um, learning curves and the ones on on, on real data. So. I felt maybe this older work could give some alternative picture 
on that. So in this talk, we try to avoid these analytical averages over the data that usually lead us to these Gaussian uh, random variables. But we use an approximation to the replicated and averaged measure. Any approximation is Gaussian. I mean, there will be Gaussians, of course. They had been so successful, but they come from a, from a, from a different point of view. Um, so we use um, approximate inference method like the variational approach uh, uh, to approximate the replicated and averaged uh, measure over the uh, random variables of the students, if you want so, and always leave the expectations over data and the task within the formalism and work on that average sort of on a final stage. And as I said, we focus on the Gaussian approximation of that measure, and I hope uh, nobody was really shocked. This work is from 2005, still in the new uh, um, century, not in the old one. And uh, so, uh, but we give, uh, but we gave, uh, haven't done essentially anything new on that, but we, we present uh, the application to old machine learning models like a Gaussian process, uh, regression problems, and uh, support vector machines, essentially kernel, uh, things in the kernel world. Okay, so I just give a, a brief review, sort of on the, on the standard way, um, possibly many of you uh, know that. So the statistical mechanics uh, applied to single layer neural networks. So usually we work on a statistical ensemble of networks, W, that defines, uh, um, um, is defined by, uh, by some, some Hamiltonian H, which is usually the sum over uh, uh, loss functions summed over training data. Uh, we have uh, also here a regularization term, and that can also be viewed as a, as a, as a Gaussian uh, prior measure over the couplings of the neural network, and the lambda mu are uh, these activation functions. And uh, so that formalism can be used sort of to, um, to model a Bayesian approach, so if we set this inverse temperature parameter beta equals one, and interpret the loss function as a negative log likelihood, then uh, um, and and uh, we are interested in, in 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 a Bayesian framework, so that would give us the posterior uh, of the uh, network parameters W, and then a student um, um, who wants to make predictions would be given by the conditional expectation of the data, um, of, of the weight vector uh, um, uh, condition on the data using uh, this uh, distribution. But uh, as is also Im important uh, for applications, very often we uh, want to have uh, not uh, an ensemble, but look at uh, sort of the minimum of the uh, cost function and uh, so then we would take this beta parameter to infinity and then this measure P of W given data would concentrate on, on that, uh, on that uh, um, uh, point. So this is the standard uh, thing and very often we use uh, two simple assumption. So the inputs X mu uh, to the network are some d-dimensional vectors and we assume that they're independently generated at random. And uh, the simplest case would be that the x, the components of each vectors, again, would be IID random variables uh, um, with zero mean and, and uh, unit uh, variance. And of course, the simplest case in that case would be they're all uh, Gaussian. Uh, but uh, um, um, even we in the old days believed that maybe this assumption is uh, sufficient to show Gaussianity for the activation functions. The assumption two is that the training labels um, that are kind of uh, the um, the training labels are generated by some kind of teacher target rule. Uh, so this uh, is given by um, a weight vector W T and the probability distribution of the uh, um, labels. Uh, given the teacher activation function lambda t. And uh, under um, uh, that condition, we are interested in computing 
the log partition function, the free energy, which uh, then can be used as a generating function for certain uh, expectations, uh, expectations uh, um, um, over, over the ensemble, but then also expectations over the data when we uh, compute uh, the um, expectation over data of the log partition function, and we use the replica trick in order to compute that. So the expectation of log z can be written as a derivative of the log of the expectation of z to the power of r, when r is a, is a real uh, uh, um, uh, um, variable, we can take the limit r to zero and take this derivative and uh, so we're happy, but uh, in practice we are able only to compute this expectation to the power of r uh, for integer r and then we try to bring our computations in such a form that uh, we can easily uh, do an analytical continuation in the simplest case in the so-called replica symmetric framework uh, and then uh, in, the, um, in the result take the limit r to zero. Um, and uh, of course uh, um, we, um, uh, we can do the expectation uh, of the replicated partition function and use already something uh, very simple where we did not make any Gaussian assumption uh, using the fact that all the data uh, um, and, and the labels are uh, independent from each others, so we get uh, n data points, so by moving the expectation over data inside, we get the expectation essentially over single data points to the power of n, and this outer thing is, is the, the Gaussian prior measure, usually I, I denote that by P, uh, P0. And uh, in, in, in the applications where we say we have this nice Gaussian equivalent, um, we can perform the um, expectation inside here in, in this term by saying, okay, everything depends only on that L, L lambda A, which are uh, linear combinations of the IID random variables X, and uh, if those, uh, um, if we have a central limit theorem or of the X's are, if the X's are Gaussian themselves, then essentially the high dimensional integral over the X is becoming a finite dimensional integral over jointly Gaussian random variables lambda one up to lambda r, r is the number again of replicas, lambda t is the teacher, so they are jointly Gaussian, and uh, here is uh, the sum over the labels that we have conditioned on the teacher lambda. So this is something that we usually do, and uh, we write that as exponential to G1 of Q, where Q is the covariance matrix of that multivariate Gaussian. I think m most of you have seen that, uh, or many of you have seen that calculation uh, before. Um, so the only thing that remains is, of course, to integrate now over, over, the, uh, over uh, the weights conditioned on uh, these uh, values Q, and that is again, um, oh sorry, here's again uh, with jointly Gaussian, and uh, these are um, the, the uh, mean zero, we have covariance QAB, and uh, so then we can express essentially the, the whole uh, um, ex, uh, expectation of the replicated partition function by an integral over these matrices Q, where we have... <laughs> So if we have inside an integral over all weight vectors, replicated weight vectors, where we fix uh, those inner products of the Ws. So essentially, so the Ws here are still coupled to each others, but they are coupled only in a macroscopic way uh, um, uh, that they have these conditions Q a, B fixed, so it's a kind of really a mean field model, very weakly coupled Qs, so essentially you say they are, if, if you take a finite set of the couplings, they, they are essentially independent, they would be even Gaussian. So you have, resulting from this Gaussian average, you have a, a Gaussian a distribution over the Ws in, in this case. Um, and uh, so in practice then uh, we can decouple the whole thing uh, using simple uh, uh, 
I would call them large deviation techniques, and then uh, represent this whole integral again as something that is exponential in the dimensionality of the weight vectors. And uh, then finally, uh, we, we can use saddle point methods to find the most likely, essentially, Q uh, um, 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 that we have here. But the only thing we need to do is, of course, something we have to work uh, on uh, what's going to happen in the limit r to 0. We have to uh, say something about replica symmetry or a more complicated stuff. So essentially, uh, replica symmetry would be to say if uh, two replicas are, are different, so two students are different, we have, we say, uh, all these matrix elements in, in the matrix QAB are equal. Um, if uh, we have, uh, if, if A is equal to B, we have uh, the self-overlap, and there's also an overlap between a student and teacher. So essentially, we plug that in, and that uh, high symmetry uh, of this, uh, of the, the joint Gaussian distribution uh, that we have here allows us to rewrite the whole Gaussian average using, so we can decompose the Gaussians into a bunch of independent ones and, and the ones that couple them. And then the important thing is we have something, a Gaussian, a inner Gaussian integral that is to the power of r. And now it seems like we can uh, analytically continue r to uh, real values and then uh, live happily thereafter. So that is essentially the very old story and um, um, how this is done if we do first the average over the uh, input uh, data x. Okay, so now what we want to do is postpone that average a little bit and don't think about too much um, about uh, Gaussianity or Gaussian equivalence of inputs, but uh, um, be a little bit motivated by, by, this, uh, by this result. So we say, OK, what comes out is essentially weakly coupled Ws. And maybe there are a lot of more cases where the Ws are weakly coupled and become essentially you know, um, independent Gaussian. So this, say, OK, we approximate these replicated posteriors by independent Gaussians to start with. Maybe we can use more complicated Gaussians later. So the idea is then saying, um, OK, we, um, again, we have training data, so start fresh. Training data, now I call them M, the total number of them for a, a reason. Now we assume that these guys are independently uh, drawn independently at random from some joint distribution of inputs and labels, and well, we work on that later. But maybe there's also a goal when we want to um, make comparisons uh, with uh, real data. We say, okay, maybe we can sample from them in some in some real data by by doing uh, um, uh, you know a splitting of the entire data set into a training and test, and then do uh, cross validation. So this is somehow that something we, we we take as an input parameter to the computation. Okay, so then we have this, this, this Hamiltonian uh, uh, for M data. Here's again the regularization of the prior. And uh, to make things look a little bit nicer in the computation, I add another Poissonization trick saying, okay, uh, possibly in the large, uh, um, I don't want to talk about uh, uh, um, um, thermodynamic limit, but let's say for a sufficiently large number of data, it doesn't make sense, it, it doesn't make a big difference to assume that uh, M is, uh, you know, not fixed, but is also a random variable with a bit of fluctuation. So we assume it's a Poisson random variable, so we fix N, the number of data on average. So that makes uh, the, the end result a, a little bit nicer. So remember, that's what we get if we uh, replicate the partition function. And we have an inner average that comes from the independence of the data. So there's something to the power of m. And here is the, the average, the expectation over essentially a single data point. And here we have something to the power of m. But we would like to have something nice uh, in the exponential that we can use for the variational approximation. So we use that artificial Poissonization step of the number uh, of, of uh, data points, 
and then uh, we write this uh, um, um, replicated averaged Hamilton um, um, partition function uh, in, a, in a new way where we have this effective Hamiltonian uh, for the a uh, for the R replicated variables and this H is now given essentially by an expectation over a single uh, a single data point where we have the loss function here. So that's a simple way and it's nice to have the exponential uh, uh, to have this expectation in the exponential. You see that in a minute. So it's a relatively simple uh, uh, way of writing things down. And now, um, okay, at some point we have to go further and do averages or whatever, but in general, let's say in finite dimensional cases for general non-Gaussian Xs, uh, we cannot solve this uh, uh, um, or simplify. Uh, and and uh, so um, we have a, in a sense, we have this replicated model that defines as an intractable uh, distribution over, over these weight vectors W. Uh, uh, so we treat it as a variational inference problem. We say we have this intractable problem that is defined uh, by this uh, prior part, and here is this intractable Hamiltonian. And so we would like to approximate this by a tractable density. Of course, uh, Gaussians are usually a good choice in a case where the Ws are, are uh, continuous random variables. And so Q would have a theta in it, and the theta would be the so-called variational parameter. Before, we had a problem where we said oh, we, get, uh, we get order parameters that come out of uh, the calculation, and we find they're most likely, uh, we find their macroscopic values. In this case, we say, OK, we introduce from outside certain uh, variational parameters theta. We have to optimize them by, by, um, f by, by optimizing uh, when we want to optimize the approximation. So they replace, in this formulism, the old order parameters. So then we would say for fixed R, uh, we would optimize these variational parameters uh, by minimizing the kullback leibler divergence between, uh, between uh, the, the, the measures uh, Q and P. So P is the intractable one, Q is the tractable one, and uh, so essentially it's this Q look Q over P and integrated over all Ws. So this essentially means we get a negative entropy term uh, for the approximating distribution, and we get something nice uh, because we have to work with log p, and log p has this, uh, by taking the log of, uh, of this thing, we get, uh, we get the, the intractable Hamiltonian down, and we have to calculate the expectation of this uh, object, and there is also the expectation over data. But now we do first the expectation over the tractable approximating distribution and fix the average over the data for a second. So, of course, if Q is a Gaussian, then we get Gaussian integrals that would replace the Gaussian integrals that we had uh, in, in the, the, the standard formulation. So, um, as, as a, an exercise, you go back to this uh, single layer uh, network, and we would start with a factorizing a Gaussian approximation, so each um, each component of the of the, the weight vector, uh, uh, um, um, uh, so all weight vectors uh, are still independent, uh, but uh, there is a as a correlate there is a dependency between the different replica of of the individual variables, and so we would say okay, uh, they have a mean of course, and uh, but all these means are the same for all the replicas, so that is replica symmetric assumption or the simplest one. But we also work with a covariance matrix, the R by R covariance matrix, that has the, uh, the replica symmetric structure that we had used in the other approach, and essentially copy and, and paste. And now if we do the computation of uh, the expectation of that term, before we had an expectation over data, now we have the expectation over the approximate uh, distribution. Um, with a little bit of work, you see, oh, there's the same structure, a bunch of Gaussian integrals, essentially a, uh, a Gaussian integral to the power of R, and we can also take 
uh, later the replica limit uh, r to zero. And I haven't talked about uh, any, any thermodynamic limit here, uh, but we see there is a little bit of a dependency on these variational parameters here, rho that has mi squared, xi squared in it, and uh, then we also can take the data average here. If we take the standard teacher-student uh, scenario from before, we can also carry out then uh, the average over, over the data, and we get agreement with the previous calculation. Let's say if we simply take xi to be plus minus one, so then all the nasty exit dependency will, will go out, and if we take all the teachers uh, by, by uh, you know, replacing them all to be equal uh, to one uh, um, and, and arguing a bit with uh, equivalence possibly, uh, um, that's okay. So we essentially get then the same result as before. I think if you would use other distributions, you would have to discuss again a bit uh, why this might work. So in some sense, you, you can get uh, the old result by assuming that there, uh, there is actually very weakly coupled, um, no couplings between the weights after, after uh, the replica and, and so on and so forth. And so this is maybe, a, it's a good variational approximation. So now to do that uh, for a, a, something slightly more complicated, um, we looked into so-called Gaussian process models, but if you want, they are nothing but single layer networks in a sense. Uh, so you would uh, work again uh, in, a, in, a, in, in, in the Gaussian, uh, um, in, in, in the Gaussian uh, prior world where you have uh, a Gaussian distribution um, uh, over the weights. And so um, if we define functions to be uh, um, uh, functions of the inputs um, as uh, linear combinations of the weights with certain given features, phi i, then this it induces a, a Gaussian distribution over functions, so a Gaussian process. Usually this is written as uh, f uh, um, is, is a realization of a Gaussian process with zero mean and kernel k, and the kernel k is essentially this weighted sum over features. And then you can show in practice everything, all the calculations only depend essentially on the, on the kernel and uh, not on the individual features. And then you go into, uh, um, into uh, um, um, a, fu um, a function uh, a presentation where you say I have a, a posterior a function over um, um, a posterior distribution or in function space, so it's conditioned on the data, which is given by a prior over functions um, that is uh, coming, uh, that has this cover covariance uh, kernel K, and there is a likelihood term. And so lots of people have, have done work on it. I think it's still a popular method uh, used in all kinds of, of uh, 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 applications. And uh, so we wanted to play uh, with that uh, slightly more complicated model. And um, so this is a bit of an illustration. So these would be samples from the Gaussian process prior. So this blue thing is essentially the prior covariance, uh, uh, the, 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 the prior variance of, of, uh, of the, the function. And if we have now one, two, three, four data points, so we see the posterior concentrates more uh, um, uh, especially where we have data, but there's a still some posterior uncertainty, and that would be uh, samples uh, conditioned on the data. So that can fit functions, uh, and, and, uh, but still these functions can be nonlinear, so we are not restricted uh, to simple linear cases. So now if we do this program of a Gaussian variational approximation for the replication, for the replicated Gaussian process models, we would have, uh, again, that measure, and we would have this effective uh, replica Hamiltonian. Uh, it's just the same story as before. So we have this E of X and Y, and, and uh, the, X, um, the, 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 the average over E to the minus uh, rep, um, sum of replicas of the loss. So very, sim uh, very similar to, to that before, but now since we, have, uh, we are working now in, in that function space, of course, there will be dependency. There are dependencies on, in, in the prior between two different input points. So it would make sense, of course, now to, to work with uh, um, uh, correlated Gaussians. And so that's what we did. So we were assuming there is a Gaussian process measure 
that approximates this, uh, this, uh, uh, this measure over replicas, where essentially we have to define a mean function and we have to uh, take a covariance, uh, um, 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 essentially a covariance kernel for, that, uh, for the approximating model that has the replica symmetric uh, ansatz uh, in it. And so uh, the interpretation of that variational uh, uh, parameter functions would be R of X would be sort of the data averaged uh, posterior mean of a function at an input point X and these other two guys would then be uh, um, uh, the, the correlation of two average uh, of two uh, expected functions uh, on, on, on two sides or uh, kind of that self overlap. Uh, so they have an interpretation. Um, and um, of course, in practice, that's, that's, it's, it's a bit horrible, right? I mean, we have to deal now with functional variational parameters. So in practice, um, we make a, a, a few further approximations. There will be operator inverses, uh, but we make approximation that are uh, justified for a larger number of data. But we have not assumed here explicitly any thermodynamic limit, but uh, so we work with that uh, formulism. Uh, and uh, so uh, the nice thing with working with these replicated uh, distributions is we can also uh, um, easily represent not only uh, expected things like here the expected loss that we can now then uh, um, evaluate in terms of the variational parameters, but we can also work with fluctuations of losses easily in the replica pictures. So if we are, for instance, interested in the expected uh, loss uh, uh, to the power of two uh, um, averaged over data sets, we need four replicas and take the replica limit to zero. But since all averages are Gaussian, they can be evaluated uh, approximately in that framework. So here's a, just a, um, 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 an evaluation on a simple one-dimensional toy data. That means the input to the whole system is one-dimensional. So, and it's, it's a uniform distribution. Uh, over um, over input uh, variables, uh, so so very far away from original Gaussian. So, uh, um, and the loss uh, again, as I said, is Gaussian process regression. So it measures uh, essentially the square loss between the the predictor and 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 the y. And the kernel is uh, um, uh, not a linear kernel, uh, so it's not really one of the the the, the old problems uh, that we had. So it's a periodic radial basis function kernel that can fit nonlinear functions. Uh, um, and here's uh, two comparisons. So when we simulated essentially uh, uh, um, um, uh, functions from the prior, added a bit noise uh, to them, and then did Gaussian process regression and, and compared the, the empirical uh, training error and the generalization error uh, with the predicted uh, um, results that we got out of the replica theory. So um, it's a very, very simple toy scenario where we say, okay, uh, uh, um, many things uh, for, because we have a uniform input distribution, so a lot of things don't depend actually on, on X. Uh, but we can also get uh, decent results for sample fluctuations of, uh, of uh, um, um, measures, for instance, of the uh, uh, training error, so how, how do they uh, fluctuate between um, data samples and uh, also uh, the, 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 uh, the uncertainty of the, uh, of the generalization error. So you can, the, the replica picture is very nice, doesn't assume that everything is self-averaging, you can get fluctuations uh, uh, decently in, in, in that framework. Okay, so now, um, yeah, is there anything we can do with real data? So there's an interesting thing. So if you go into the, 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 this computational framework uh, with this approximating Gaussians, so you might be interested in saying something, okay, I want to evaluate certain functions that depend on uh, uh, posterior averages um, in, a, in a, a complicated way, and we want to evaluate them on training data. So. This runs, sorry, that should be a mu. It runs over all the training data. So we want to know what is, if we have an average over training data, how can that be con, uh, converted into something over test data? 
So if we go into the formulism, um, it's a bit, uh, um, it's a bit um, uh, complicated, but essentially we can transform that into something that contains the average over the uh, data generating mechanism. We haven't specified what that is, but within the Gaussian approximation, we can relate an empirical average to an average over x, y drawn at random from the data generator. And this is a complicated thing involving a bun bunch of Gaussians. But for certain things, they can be evaluated. And uh, there's one example that we tested it on. So we, um, um, of course, we, this is the uncertainty of the, the Bayesian uncertainty of the prediction of uh, the, the, the function at, uh, um, at uh, the data points uh, in, in the data set. So this should be usually small, but here is something that relates the, uh, vari um, the, the variance, the uncertainty of the prediction at uh, arbitrary input points x averaged over over uh, uh, all um, possible, over the density of input points. So that would be the prediction that uh, this method gives. And so we can use simply uh, a data set, split it into test and training data, and check if this, uh, if this relation is fulfilled. And you see it seems to be fulfilled uh, 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 very well uh, for, well, I mean, that's what we could do. There were data sets that you would do in the, in the early 2000s. Uh, so it's not really huge, but it seems, well, possibly if they're bigger, they, it gets better uh, even. So it means we can, this method leads us to relations between certain things evaluated at, at data that are in the training set, and uh, they can be represented. As I said, you know, this expectation over the data generating mechanism is a part of the formulism. I don't perform it, uh, perform it analytically, but uh, um, we, use, uh, we use data splits uh, uh, for doing that. Um, okay, how much is uh, left? Uh... Okay, okay, fine. So um, as, a, as a relative uh, to, uh, to Gaussian process methods, um, we also looked at uh, support vector machines and uh, so they can be viewed as some sort of um, um, Gaussian process model. So we have the problem of uh, a classifier with binary uh, labels, plus minus one. There is also a feature, an implicit feature representation in terms of weights. And uh, the uh, support vector training uh, can be formulated as a minimization of the length of the weight vector such that these things are always greater than uh, one. And uh, so it's also known as a maximal margin classifier. And the, the nice thing is, uh, um, based on a kernel trick, everything can be expressed in terms of kernels. So in, 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 in many cases, that would be a sum over infinitely many features. But uh, we can do everything with kernels. And uh, so at the end of the day, um, to relate that to the to the previous uh, things that we've done with Gaussian processes, we can work with a pseudo posterior p over weights um, using that uh, pseudo likelihood and a prior that essentially says um, we put we make the the prior over weights smaller and smaller so that enforces the minimization in the limit epsilon to zero. So. We, we work with that pseudo posterior, do all the things that we've done before, then take the limit epsilon to zero to reach the, uh, um, to reach the support vector limit. And uh, uh, finally, we rewrite everything in terms of measures over function space and, and then have again uh, the replicated measure over functions. And here's this prior measure and uh, as before, some something that uh, that uh, has this expectation in front of it, so we can essentially use um, really apply the results that we have uh, developed before for Gaussian uh, similar to Gaussian process regression, and uh, so some of the predicted relations would be, uh, for instance, there's a number of uh, support vectors that are uh, the data points that that end up on on, on the margin, so. That can be represented by an expectation 
over the data generating mechanism. Phi is uh, the cumulative Gaussian, uh, and this involves a bunch of uh, um, the what I would call the order parameters or the variational parameters that, that we had. And they can be also computed uh, from, from the data set. So that would be the zero one loss, the number of misclassification. You can do uh, more complicated things, but they would fill sort of the whole page. And that's why I didn't uh, give it. So again, we can use, uh, um, try that on real data. So there was a, um, a data set which is nine dimensional here, not infinite dimensional, so we get some decent, decent approximations here. This is not so nice, but uh, for a small number of, of example data, possibly the approximation is not so good. So, um, yeah, essentially, this is all I, I wanted to say. Um, so I try to explain a framework where we have, uh, where we uh, approximate the replica measure um, for a given data distribution, but not performing the average over, over uh, the data explicitly, not making a explicit Gaussian assumption, um, but um, um, the Gaussian assumption comes in, uh, of course, in the, in the variational approximation. Uh, what I also liked um, was um, we did not have to define explicit teachers in a supervised learning case. Um, and uh, the approach uh, predicts uh, certain relations between, between uh, expectations on training and test uh, data that could be uh, of interest and they can be applied to kernel machines. And of course, um, yeah, can that be useful? I don't know. First of all, can it be extended to interesting things? I mean, I, you know, I don't know what, we all have different interests. I mean, I like dynamics, and I always said, you know, oh, can't, we, um, can't we apply uh, this, this to, to dynamics to get something uh, that we can compare on real data? That's what I want to do. Well, neural nets, uh, who knows? I mean, we know we have Bayesian neural nets, essentially, where we do, where, where people uh, approximate posteriors over network weights using also variational techniques and make all kinds of approximations. Why not put replicas on top of that approximation and uh, do something with it? Maybe it's possible. Of course, I mean, maybe there's nothing for, for the mathematically minded uh, among you. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know, when is this good or bad or it might be even become exact under certain scenarios in the thermodynamic limit? Is there something that can be can be said in that cases, and of course, um, um, of course, there will be hidden assumptions on data distributions. Uh, when you know, when does it lead to uh, effective uh, um, um, measures over over these weights W? But I've sort of you know uh, circumvented that problem. But uh, what I got was something that might be uh, easier computable without assuming specific teachers. Um, but of course, it's easy to construct counterexamples. Essentially, if uh, you want to do it on a, in a practical situation, so I mean, the idea was be to sample uh, um, um, data from the generating mechanisms, so relations between training data and holdout data. But let's say we have a, a, a relatively small data set. Then essentially, you sample from a discrete distribution, and we had done work before that. Uh, um, it was also mentioned in Professor Takahashi's uh, work. Yeah, so we would have to introduce extra random variables saying, oh, is this guy inside of the training set or not? And then it turns out the simple Gaussian approximation is not good. We have to do something a bit more uh, um, um, advanced, though, for instance, using expectation propagation uh, things. Uh, so we have to go beyond the Gaussian approximation. So it's not... Uh, uh, something that is always working, but uh, yeah. And then at the end of the day, I thought, oh, maybe what I'm doing here is maybe a little bit related to somehow averaging over TAP equations, but I don't know the answer. And I think now I'm uh, uh, done with my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Perry. Uh, the good talk. Yes, the the one no the good point of the variational approach is uh, uh, 
guarantee of the gap approximation. For example, the, we can't have a upper bound or yeah, something. Yeah. Yes, yes. What, what the, yes, this is my question. So, no, I don't uh, know anything. I don't know about the properties when I, when I take R. Okay, so the, the, if the R equals zero, we, it does not hold. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know. I mean, essentially, we haven't really looked at it. And, and I'm convinced that we should do it. Maybe mm -hmm. we find out what is actually, what happens in the, when, when we really take the limit. What is optimized in our yeah, yeah. The bound is only for integer R. Okay, so we cannot expect that uh, it uh, creates some bounds for R equals zero. I, I don't know. Okay, I thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you a lot for the talk. It was very interesting. Uh, first, let me say that uh, here. <laughs> Sorry if uh, we have overlooked this work. I think it's very interesting. I personally didn't know it, and uh, I think some of some of the approximations you make, I think, are uh, related to some of like the stuff that we have been doing on kernels, and some colleagues have been doing on kernels. So we should definitely try as a community to to fix this uh, overlooking. I have two small, um, maybe more technical questions. The first one is, if I understood correctly, the um, the average over the teacher, you just defer it to the end. Yeah. So in yeah. But, but when, you, when you want to plot these learning curves, yeah. somehow you need to take this average, right, to, to be able to, to plot these theoretical curves. So how do you do that? Do you, do you approximate it in the whole data set as a population average? Um, I think following. So we said, uh, um, we said we approximate the average over the teacher. Yeah. Uh, and then we have to Over the whole data set, and then if you want to know the performance, at, I don't know. Uh -huh. Okay. 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 Thanks. And the other small question was: um, I was really like curious about this, like grand canonical approximation, like or this Poisson introduction, like where you let ver to like the number of samples to fluctuate. So do you have an intuition of why, why this is important? Does, why does it make it easier? Okay, I'm gonna take a look. Looks like a nice tree. Thanks. Okay. Sorry, I had a question, but that was his second question. <laughs> now it's fine. <laughs> uh, I guess I have maybe a naive question but so is there an example of a system where is there an example of a system where you understand this approach to be exact but maybe it's not exact if I don't consider a variation approximation of that? yeah is there a simple example of a model where you understand this to be as Uh, then it reproduces the replica calculation, right? <laughs> 
Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Professor Oprah again.